Hi, my name is Joey Bookholtz. I am the anaesthesia nurse working at London Veterinary Specialists, a multidisciplinary referral centre in North London. This webinar is going to cover some of the common issues we can come across when monitoring anaesthesia. And my main aim is to give other nurses confidence when analysing what we may see with our patients and how to manage any issues that arise. To start, I wanted to highlight the importance of understanding the ASA classifications, as it is vital for us to think of each patient individually, including their full history and current underlying issues, as well as the procedure about to be performed. There are five categories. One, a normal and healthy patient. Two, a patient with mild systemic disease. Three, a patient with a systemic disease that is well compensated for or well controlled. Four, a patient with severe uncompensated systemic disease. And five, a patient that is unlikely to survive. Note that there is an E for emergency, and that can be applied to any grade. It just signifies that the general anaesthetic and the procedure to be performed are an emergency. For example, the procedure may be a straightforward dental, but the patient has a heart murmur. Therefore, the patient is ASA grade three and this may affect the drug choices for pre-medication or induction. Another point I would like to make is that age is not a disease. A patient may be geriatric, and that can sometimes make people nervous about an anaesthetic. But what is important to consider is the patient's underlying issues that have evolved with age, which will influence the anaesthetic plan. You may have even a perfectly fit and healthy older patient that has no issues, who tolerates an anaesthetic much better than a younger patient that has an underlying disease. So don't be fooled by a patient's age. Taking a baseline reading of all patients prior to an anaesthetic is vital, as it allows us to have a comparison when the patient is anaesthetized. For example, if is the patient you just induced bradycardic because of the pre-medication drugs such as metatomidine, or was that the normal heart rate for that patient? Some are not so easy on our conscious patients. They're a little wound up after arriving to the practice, such as temperature and blood pressure. But the more parameters measured, the more prepared you are. It is worth knowing the signs of dehydration so that you could identify them and accurately plan for the patient's intravenous fluid therapy. Watching the patient's natural breathing rhythm may help you imitate it later if IPVV is required. If you're not familiar with different lung sounds, such as crackles, wheezes, or even absent lung sounds, try and get some practice with other patients. If your vet identifies something, have a listen so that you can identify it in the future. The same goes for heart murmurs. Try and practice listening to heart and lung sounds on all possible patients in the practice. And consider the position of the heart murmur. Try and work out which heart valve it may be linked to. When it comes to anaesthesia, preparation is key. Understanding your patient and the procedure to be performed is just as important to preparation as making sure you have everything ready. For example, do you have a range of smaller ET tubes that are expected for a brachycephalic patient? These patients are prone to hypoplastic tracheas, so they would require a smaller tube than another breed of dog that is the same size. Sometimes the intubation can be really difficult with the averted saccules and elongated soft palate. Hence, being equipped for a difficult intubation is key. So as well as small ET tubes, perhaps a dog urinary catheter to provide oxygen whilst trying to intubate. The brachycephalics are also prone to regurgitation, so having suction equipment ready for intubation and recovery is always important. Have a think. Could you prepare like this for other cases you see too? For example, suction and head up induction for the vomiting foreign body dog, or difficult intubation in a cat with a laryngeal mass. Following on from understanding the ASA classifications, it is really important to read the patient history. I'm sure there are many of us that just administer, administer the pre-medication as told to, and then proceed to monitor the patient looking out for the common signs without fully understanding our case. Without reading a patient history, how can we accurately assign an ASA grade? Do we know what to look out for whilst monitoring, other than the obvious signs of pain or change in plane of anaesthesia? 
For example, a dog with a mitral valve disease cannot tolerate tachycardia as well as a healthy patient. Or does the patient have any recent blood tests showing abnormal liver or kidney parameters? Liver or kidney disease would mean that the patient's ability to eliminate the drugs is compromised, so those doses would need to be reduced. Another consideration is if a patient has any allergies. For example, a patient with a chicken allergy may not tolerate the sensitivity food in recovery. Has the patient had any previous reactions to antibiotics or abnormal responses to opioids? Are there previous sedation or anaesthetic records? Often if a protocol worked well before, perhaps it's worth using again. Although as nurses we cannot prescribe, I think it's really important for us to consider what pre-medication and analgesia is appropriate for our patients. Often, pain relief is considered for pre-medication and sometimes on recovery, but there are many different points on the pain pathway where we can intercept pain and keep our patients more comfortable throughout the procedure. For example, dentals and orthopaedics almost always involve some local anaesthesia in the form of blocks. But perhaps the vets can consider the use of an epidural for other procedures too. Perhaps a CRI of analgesia during the procedure could keep the patient comfortable as well as act as max sparing to reduce the amount of isoflurane required. It is best practice to try and use the multimodal approach by combining drugs acting at various points on the pathway. Not only will adequate analgesia reduce the amount of volatile agent required, thereby making the process safer, but also by using small doses of many different drugs, the side effects of each drug are reduced. Take a look at the diagram here showing the different pain pathways and note the different classes of drugs that act on each pathway. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs act at the periphery where transduction of a noxious stimulus occurs, such as mechanical, chemical, thermal pain or injury. When the pain signal is sent along the nerve fibres towards the spinal cord, this is known as transmission, which is where local anaesthesia takes action by blocking those pain signals. Drug classes such as alpha-2s, opioids, ketamine and nitrous oxide all act at the spinal cord level where the pain signals are modulated and either sent onto the brain for perception or relayed to the reflex arc in the spinal cord. At the brain, perception of pain occurs and this is intercepted by the same drugs acting on modulation as well as anaesthesia. On the right here is a typical ECG waveform. This can differ if the ECG electrodes are placed on different feet or areas of the body, and sometimes the T wave can be inverted, but they should generally hold this shape. A P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. One thing I will always find our anaesthetist reminding me is when looking at your ECG, consider the size and speed of the waveform on the multi-parameter. Often you can alter the size, so when the trace looks big, abnormal and scary, but there are still P, QRS and T waves, try reducing the size to make it look more normal. And sometimes you can change the speed of the wave to either widen or narrow it. This isn't to say that all abnormal traces are just because of our monitor settings there. Here is an example where initially the trace looks quite scary. It's large and it has an abnormal and wide inverted T wave. However, we fiddled with the settings and changed the size from about times four to times one to make the wave smaller and increased the speed of the waveform to make it narrower. You can now see that it looks more normal. Know that the T wave is still inverted, but this was of no concern. an ECG trace, it is really useful to follow these questions to determine whether there is an arrhythmia or not. What is the heart rate? Is the trace regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? I.e. is the abnormality of the ECG rhythm the same every time or does it occur randomly? Is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Is there a QRS complex for every P wave? 
What are the PR intervals? So the distance between the P wave and the R wave within each beat. And the RR intervals, which is the distance between the R waves of each beat. What is the QRS morphology? I.e. what does it look like? For example, is it wide and bizarre? Bradycardia is one of the most common ECG rhythms seen in practice. And I find that a lot of nurses panic when they see it. Using the questions, we can see that it is a sinus rhythm, meaning it is normal rhythm, but just slow. Each wave is regular. There are P waves, QRS complexes, and T waves for every beat. And the intervals remain the same. Obviously, each case is different, and I want to highlight that it is important to understand ECG rhythms and really think about why you might be seeing them. Don't just say, oh, the patient's bradycardic, but it's fit and healthy, or it's had metatomidine. Make sure that is the reason. Don't just assume it. A lot of the time, we do see bradycardia in patients pre-medicated with alpha-2 agonists, and often the heart rates can go as low as 30 to 40. But this is when you consider your patient, its history, and other parameters. If you can see that the BP, the blood pressure, is normal to high, then the body has compensated well and maintained cardiac output. So the bradycardia is less concerning. If the blood pressure is low, then the cardiac output will fall, risking poor perfusion of vital organs. This needs addressing. If there is sinus rhythm, then again, this is less concerning than if an arrhythmia develops, such as AV block. As well as being drug-induced, bradycardia could be due to a deep plane of anaesthesia. So check your patient and volatile agent. Sometimes a dramatic drop could be a vagal response to surgical stimulation, such as putting on the ovaries in a stay. If you see a change in heart rate, consider what the surgeon might currently be doing and suggest, could they maybe be a little more gentle? Tachycardia is another common ECG rhythm seen in practice. Using the questions, we can see that it is a fast but sinus rhythm. Each wave is regular, there are P waves, QRS complexes and T waves for every beat, and the intervals remain the same. The main concerns with tachycardia are the increased oxygen demand for the myocardia, but a reduction in time for myocardial perfusion which further reduces oxygenation. Myocardial perfusion occurs during diastole, when the heart muscle relaxes. So if the heart is pumping really fast, there is less time for diastole, meaning the heart muscle itself does not get enough time to be perfused, risking myocardial ischemia. Atrial filling also occurs during diastole, so with tachycardia, the atria won't fill properly, resulting in a reduction of preload and therefore causing cardiac output to fall. Again, checking your patient is vital. It could be light and about to wake up, or it could be painful and requiring more analgesia. It is important to consider the difference between light anesthesia and pain. So often a reaction to a painful stimulus is mistaken for light anesthesia, and the volatile agent is turned up, leading to detrimental effects of deep anesthesia. This is why it is so important to use your visual parameters to check depth, not just relying on the multi-parameter. Tachycardia may be a reflex due to hypotension, so check your blood pressure and treat if necessary to prevent organ ischemia. It is important to watch the end tidal carbon dioxide too, because if a patient is hypercapnic, this can then act as a sympathomimetic meaning it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, resulting in tachycardia. Similarly to bradycardia, check what the surgeon is currently doing. Could there be a hemorrhage? Tachycardia is the initial response before a fall in blood pressure, so this could be a sign of bleeding. Or could the vet be occluding a major vessel such as the vena vit cava during deep abdominal surgery? This would dramatically reduce the venous return, also known as, known as preload, and therefore stroke volume. This is detected by baroreceptors in the aorta and stimulates, stimulates a reflex tachycardia, which is not exactly the most intelligent of reflexes, as it then further reduces ventricular filling because of the reduced time for diastole. 
so you can see why tachycardia can quickly escalate and become worrying. Sinus arrhythmia is the term used to describe the sinus rhythm, whereby the heart rate increases when the patient breathes in, then slowly again, then slows again for expiration. It is classed as regularly irregular because it occurs every time the patient breathes, so it has a regular pattern. This is normal and is often seen alongside bradycardia and in fit and healthy patients. It is caused by the changes in thoracic pressures as the patient breathes. So when the patient breathes in, the negative pressure draws air in and also draws more blood in, causing the atria to fill quicker. This means that the heart rate rises to pump the higher volume of blood back out again. When the patient exhales, the pressure in the thorax goes back to normal so there is slower filling of the atria, leading to the heart rate slowing again. First degree AV block is where there is a delay between the P wave and the QRST complex. It isn't with every beat, so you may even miss it. It is more likely to be detected on a paper trace ECG than on a multi-parameter. This arrhythmia can occur with various heart rates, although it is more commonly seen alongside bradycardia. You can see that I have said that the trace could be both regular or irregular, and this is because the regularity of rhythm is down to the RR interval. If the P wave occurs with sinus rhythm, then the RR interval would stay the same, so the trace would appear regular. However, if there is sinus arrhythmia, when the heart rate changes with breathing, then the distances between R waves will vary, and therefore the AV block would appear to be irregular. P waves and QRS complexes are still present for every P and there is no abnormal morphology. There is just a delay between the two, which causes a delay in the PR interval, but the RR intervals should remain the same, unless sinus arrhythmia is also present. If you've noticed first degree AV block, it could be drug induced and alongside bradycardia. It usually isn't of any concern, I would be concentrating on the bradycardia or watching for development of worse arrhythmias, such as second degree AV block. Second degree AV block is shown by loss of the QRS complex. Therefore, there are lone P waves occasionally. This means that the ventricles fail to depolarize as there is no electrical impulse passing through the AV node. You can see the lone P wave on this video. Again, it is a one-off, so it is easily missed. It is important to watch these closely and alert the surgeon in case they develop and require treating especially if there is severe bradycardia and the blood pressure is low. With the ventricles failing to depolarize, escape rhythms can, may develop where a random QRS complex arises, completely disconnected from a P wave. This is often when the second degree, degree AV block is worsening and there's also a sign of perhaps considering treatment. It is vital to monitor blood pressure during sedation and anesthesia so we can monitor organ perfusion. If a patient is hypotensive, then there is inadequate blood flow to vital organs, and this can risk permanent organ damage. Values differ between patients, but generally we don't want the blood pressure to drop below a minimum value, so avoiding systolic as low as 80 to 90 is best. If it gets this low, intervention is required. There are several reasons for low blood pressure, such as hypothermia, deep planar anesthesia, a fall in cardiac output, vasodilation, or prolonged hemorrhage. So checking all parameters is paramount. As I said before, physically checking the patient is vital, as well as using the parameters provided by machines. With regards to hemorrhage, a fall in blood pressure is a delayed response, because initially there will be tachycardia to compensate and maintain blood flow to organs. But as venous return falls, cardiac output falls, 
and eventually the body cannot maintain blood pressure. Hypertension can also be a concern during anaesthesia, as there is a risk of injury to vital organs by overperfusion. It also means that the heart is pumping against a greater resistance, often referred to as afterload, which increases the workload on the heart. Therefore, anaesthesia is a balancing act, and we try to aim for blood pressure as close to normal as possible. Just like hypotension, there are many causes of hypertension, such as a light plane of anaesthesia, pain, hypercapnia, vasoconstriction, or underlying diseases, for example, Cushing's disease, and sometimes in chronic kidney disease. By reading the patient's history prior to induction, hypertension could possibly be predicted and prepared for in advance. Again, the importance of assessing your patient and the point of surgery is clear to determine the best way to approach the blood pressure. My top tip for the day would be, if you get a chance, take some time to get to know your bounty parameters. After all, we spend enough time with them. Knowing how to change the settings to display what you need to know is always useful. I find changing the boundaries for my alarms to what is relevant for that exact patient really helps me concentrate. Then the alarms will only go off for values that are actually concerning for that particular case. If you don't adjust the limits and just silence them every time, thinking to yourself, yes, I know you think the patient is bradycardic, but I know he's fine. You may find yourself ignoring the alarm and missing a problem. Now, I think a whole other pre presentation could be written on capnography to explain equipment, lung volumes and traces. But as this is a quick presentation on troubleshooting, I have just given you some common traces seen in practice. Before that, remember to check your patient. An abnormal capnograph trace could be due to equipment malfunction or displacement of an ET tube. So it is vital to ch fully check your patient, the ET tube, and then the breathing system. If your machine is shouting apnea, this could well be true, particularly immediately after propofol induction or respiratory arrest. But back to the previous point of checking your patient, has the breathing system become detached? Tachypnea could be due to a light plane of anesthesia, pain or hypothermia. The main concern is not so much the low end tidal CO2, but more that the patient is probably not taking a deep enough breath to inhale the oxygen and volatile agent. Don't be afraid to IPPV to help give the patient a deeper breath in the hope that it would eventually settle. Often we have those patients that just never settle and we end up providing IPPV intermittently throughout the procedure. These cases are usually great candidates for a ventilator to take control. The main point I would like to touch on is rebreathing. Again, something that spooks many nurses, but is not always too concerning. Often rebreathing in a non-rebreathing circuit, such as a T-piece or a vein, is due to inadequate fresh gas flow. So the expired gases aren't pushed into the scavenging quick enough, causing the patient to breathe it back in again, and eventually leading to an increase in entidal carbon dioxide. This is easily counteracted by increasing your fresh gas flow. But remember that firstly, a high fresh gas flow is wasteful of oxygen and volatile agent. And secondly, volatile agents are potent greenhouse gases. So it's worthwhile considering the economical and environmental impact of increasing the flow. If the patient's end tidal CO2 is not rising, then the patient is tolerating the rebreathing, and so the fresh gas flow may not need to be changed right away. Try to prepare before induction by calculating the fresh gas flow properly for every patient. Usually that overestimates, so it should deliver plenty of gas to the patient. Then, where possible, without becoming detrimental to the patient of course, reduce the fresh gas flow and volatile agents. If the patient is rebreathing on a circle system, this could be due to saturated soda lime or valve sticking. The soda lime should be changed as soon as it changes colour. Don't wait for the whole circle to change. One point to consider here is there are different types of soda lime. Some turn different colours and some can even change back to the original colour once fully saturated. So keep a close eye on your circles and note when the colour starts to change. If you can, change the soda lime as soon as possible. But that doesn't necessarily mean mid-op. 
only if the patient's end tidal CO2 starts to rise. Otherwise, the soda lime can be changed at the end of the procedure. One of the possible for rebreathing is due to dead space in the system, often due to the, end, the ET tube being too long, as you can see in this picture. It is always best to measure the ET tube against your patient before induction, and if possible, cut the tube down to size. I know some practices don't like to cut tubes, but it is useful to have a range of lengths for each size of tube so that you can accommodate all shapes and sizes of patients. The tray seen for an ET tube that is too far in, too far out, or not cuffed enough, is a much smaller size of wave in comparison to a normal wave, and that is because it is only sampling a small volume of air passing in and out of the patient's lungs. If you see this waveform, then check your patient. Can you hear any gas escaping around the tube when the patient exhales? Or can you smell isoflurane? Can you cuff the tube anymore? Some practices do not cuff cat tubes, so if this is the case, maybe consider re-intubating with a larger ET tube. Or is the tube hanging out like in this picture? Could it have slipped and needs readjusting? Could it be too far in? If there is no gas escaping and the tube doesn't seem to be too far out, could the tube be too far in and therefore only in one bronchus rather than the trachea? If you think this is the case, what happens if you ever so slightly draw the tube out by a few millimetres? If you are unsure of your ET tube placement, don't be afraid to mention to the vet that you would like to check this, even if that means pausing surgery. Maintaining a patent airway is vital. Perhaps keep a laryngoscope with you at all times to make sure to make checking tube placement easier when rummaging around under the drapes. Lastly, the telltale sign of a blocked tube is the shark fin shape, shaped curve. Could the patient's airway be full of mucus, which is plugging the tube? Could there be blood or aspiration of vomit? Use a large, sorry, you can use a laryngoscope to check the patient's mouth and larynx without extubating. Try and suction the larynx or even extubate and re-intubate. Similarly to capnography, fluid therapy can have a presentation of its own. So I'll only touch on the main points that are often a controversial topic. Many people approach it in many different ways. So with my anesthesia certificate, we were taught to use a surgical rate fluid of five millilitres per kilo per hour for the first hour, then reduce that by 50% each hour until at maintenance. But this could still pose a risk of overperfusion. Here at LBS, almost every patient receives maintenance or twice maintenance unless told otherwise. It is important to remember that the days where surgical rate of 10 mils per kilo per hour are long gone. Often the 10 mil per kilo dose is used for boluses over 5 to 15 minutes, but rarely used as a continuous rate. To touch on the topic of bolusing, it is important to consider the patient's volume status. If the patient is hypotensive, it is not necessarily hypovolemic and in need of a bolus. Some approaches are to try a bolus, or several, before trying drug intervention, but this isn't always appropriate such as in a heart, case disease, a heart disease case. So again, in LVS, we consider if the patient is actually in need of fluids such as dehydration or hemorrhage, then decide between giving fluids or drugs. Always discuss your findings with the vet and make a decision on how best to manage each particular case together. Don't forget your manual observations such as mucous membranes, capillary refill times and pulse quality. As I said at the beginning, it is worth knowing the signs of dehydration and how to calculate dehydration, but I'll save that for a later date. I've just popped in an example of calculating a bolus to be given over 10 minutes to show how to get from a five mil per kilo dose to the rate required. So a 10 kilo dog needing a five mil per kilo bolus over 10 minutes means the dog needs a total volume of 50 millimeters, 10 kilos times five mils per kilo, and there are six lots of minute, 10 minutes in an hour. So times 50 millilitres by six, which gives 300 millilitres per hour, which is the rate for us to put in the drip pump. To bring that back to a millilitre per kilo per hour rate, I've divided the rate by the patient's weight, 10, to show 30 millilitre per kilo per hour. One major misconception with anaesthesia is that once the volatility Volatile agent is switched off, the worst is over. 
but actually most anaesthetic deaths occur in recovery. So it's absolutely vital that the patients are closely monitored in recovery too. As with induction, it is important to have equipment ready, such as intubation kits, particularly for those brachycephalic, suction, oxygen supplementation, and definitely warming devices. The patients start losing heat right in induction, so imagine how cold they can get after a long surgery. Keeping them warm not only maintains their blood pressure, but it also aids a quicker recovery. We want to warm them quick enough to avoid the need to shiver as it increases their oxygen demand, but not so quick that they become too hot. Just be careful with heating brachycephalics on recovery. We don't want them to overheat or develop respiratory distress. They find it hard enough to breathe when they're awake. Again, check their history for any dietary requirements as our post-op ID may upset their sensitive tummies. And lastly, update the owners as soon as the patient is awake and fully recovered. Even if you want to crack on with the next procedure on the long list of things to do, we all know how anxious clients can be, so it's nice for them to hear that their baby is awake and doing well and when they can bring them home. The main anaesthesia motto for me is never panic. If something goes wrong, the patient is already intubated. They should have an accessible IV and you already have the monitoring equipment attached. So all you need is a vet and maybe some drugs. I've always been told that it is safer to have the patient closer to a light plane of anesthesia than deep, so don't be dial happy with a volatile agent. Consider other drugs to reduce stimulation and always manually monitor your patient as well as using your machines. It's always good to be prepared for most possible situations with anesthesia, so have a clutter-free, well-organized table and get ready for each anesthetic as much in advance as possible. Calculate the fresh gas flow, drugs, CRIs, fluids, boluses and emergency drugs and log them all on a separate sheet to your GA record to refer to if necessary. Consider the need for difficult intubation or re-intubation kits, suction and if IPPV is, up, is likely needed. If it is, is your breathing system you have chosen appropriate? Another motto is when in doubt IPPV. If the patient is bradypneic and hypercapnic, give some breaths, IPPV. Hyperventilating and hypocapnic, IPPV. If the patient is panting and not taking proper breaths, i.e. those annoying little terriers in dentals, IPPV to give them deeper breaths to breathe in more volatile agent and settle. Like I said earlier, sometimes we have those patients that breath hold or pant no matter what. And unless you are lucky enough to have a ventilator to take control, IPPV is your best friend. It is good practice to get the feel for giving IPPV as much as possible, so you can get used to feeling the natural resistance of the chest, also known as compliance, and watch the chest rise and fall to mimic normal breathing. Practice makes perfect, so don't be shy. Finally, some frequently asked questions that I've come across. Of course, if anyone would like to submit more, please do send an email to LVS. Myself or, an, or our anaesthetist will be happy to answer them. Most of these we have already covered, but it is good revision. I hope you notice the theme of IPPV and adequate analgesia. Don't just put them deeper with more volatile agent. So, for panty dogs under GA, ask yourself, could it be light? Is there sufficient analgesia on board? Could it be too warm? Usually, if I'm happy that it isn't light or painful or hyperthermic, I will IPPV for the patient or use our ventilator. High ISO is still reacting? No patient be, should be kept on a high percentage of volatile agent. If your patient still seems to be reacting despite being on a level of high volatile agent, perhaps there is inadequate analgesia. Try and address this by considering the paint pathway and what drugs could be added to help the patient and facilitate a lower level of volatile agent. Remember the reasons for why end tidal CO2 may be creeping up? Rebreathing, hyperventilation, deep plane of anesthesia. To address patients that are constantly needing IPPV, address the possible causes. As I said, some IPPV will help correct the small breaths and hypocapnia by giving the odd deeper breath, but always try to get to the bottom of the issue too. Again, the balance between depth and volatile agents. Consider the sedation and analgesia on board. 
Can you add in something that is max faring so you don't need to turn the patient's volatile agent up? Or is the patient just not taking a deep enough breath to get the ISO? IPPV could also help in this case. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to refer to any cases to us or need advice from any of our specialists, please take a look at our website or contact us. We are currently hosting days for vets and nurses, once lockdown is over, of course. So if you would like to come and shadow David Aranesitis, or if you're interested in arranging a visit, please do not hesitate to ask us a question or contact us. I hope this presentation has answered some questions and helped build your confidence with anaesthesia. Thank you again and goodbye.